joining today's University of Texas Energy Symposium. Today is a special edition of the University of Texas Energy Symposium. We are having a debate on fossil fuel divestment of university of universities and endowments. So as an introduction, uh, you are to part of the debate. Please answer the pre-debate survey. They'll have links here on the next few introductory slides. I'm Kerry King. I'm a research scientist and assistant director of the Energy Institute here at the University of Texas. I'm also a lecturer in the Business Government Society Department of the Macomb School of Business. I'd like to also thank Laura Starks for connecting me with some of the participants of today's debate. She is our, a professor in the Macomb School of Business as well. Today, we have an Oxford style debate uh, for participants and the format is as follows. You, the uh, audience, uh, the job is for you to vote on the debate uh, before the debate and after the debate. And we will have opening remarks from each side. And we have, uh, after that, the opening remarks from each side will be 20 minutes. Then there will be an intra-panel discussion. Then there'll be a question and answer period from you, the audience. So please submit questions via the question and answer feature of, um, of Zoom. And then after that, there will be short closing remarks from each side. And then you, the attendees again, will vote on the question. Again, the vote uh, on the question, use the QR code here for the pre-debate question. So now I will briefly introduce our four debate participants. Um, one at a time, very briefly, and then we will just get to their uh, content. So uh, one of these on the uh, against fossil fuel divestment side is Bradford Cornell or Brad Cornell. Cornell. He's Emeritus Professor of Financial Economics, Anderson School of Management at UCLA. He stopped courses on applied corporate finance, investment banking, and corporate valu valuation, and he developed a new course on energy, climate change, and finance. He's the author of a recent book, Global Climate Change, a Pragmatist's Guide to Moving the Needle. One of the persons on the for divestment side is Dan Cohn. He is a global energy transition researcher at the Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis. His research focuses on protecting institutional investment funds from volatility associated with global commodity prices and the fossil fuel industry. And he's become an expert in coal mining industry and the regulatory framework, including coal mining cleanup. His cohort on the four or yes answer to the question for divestment side is Cutler Cleveland. He's professor of earth and environment and also interim director of the Institute for Global Sustainability and a faculty affiliate of the Center for Anti-Racist Research at all at Boston University. He studies the connections among energy, climate change and human well-being and principal investigator for Carbon Free Boston, which was an assessment of the strategies to help the city of Boston reach carbon neutrality by 2050. And the fourth of our participants is Brent Bennett. Brent is the policy director of Life Powered, which is an initiative of the Texas Public Policy Foundation to raise America's energy IQ and the premier voice in Texas and across the country on energy freedom and human flourishing. Um, Brent has a master's and a PhD in material science and engineering here from the University of Texas. So with that being said, I welcome all of our participants and I now relinquish the sharing of my screen to the first of the opening remarks, which will come from Brad Cornell. Brad, go ahead. Thank you. <clears throat> Let's make sure that we've got the, um, the sharing working here. Uh, Okay. That is you good. Thank you. My uh, slide? Yes, that is good. Thank you. Okay. So thanks for having me. Uh, the question we're addressing here is shown at the top in green, but I think it's important to remember that the goal is to reduce CO2 emissions without a reduction in overall human well being, not to try to identify villains to blame or to promote one's own sense of moral superiority. And there's another thing I think that's critical to keep in, in mind in this entire debate, and that's the role of economic growth. And in that respect, uh, I've, I've turned to Robert Gordon's classic book on the rise and fall of American growth. And Professor Gordon 
notes that between 1870 and 1940, America experienced the greatest growth that anyone ever had, basically. And to, to show you the, the impact of that growth, I have a few quotes from this book. In 1870, the population of America was 40 million. 75% of the population was rural. Life expectancy was 45 years. Consumption per capita was $2,800 in 2010 dollars, not 1870 dollars, and went almost entirely to food, clothing, and shelter. The share of homes that had electricity was exactly zero. The share with central heating and indoor plumbing was very, very nearly zero. There was no running water, bathrooms, or flush toilets. Every family was directly or indirectly dependent on the horse. Family members not only had to carry out the daily activity of moving clean and dirty water, coal, wood, and ashes into and out of the dwelling, but also had to expend further labor making food and clothing. It sounds a lot more like the Middle Ages than it does like modern life. By 1940, the situation was dramatically different because of economic growth, and fossil fuels had their footprint all over that growth. In 19, uh, between those time periods, fossil fuels were central in thermal generation of electricity, the development of, of internal combustion engines for light vehicles and farm equipment, airplanes, diesel locomotives, diesel and electric shipping, and the Haber-Borsch process for the manufacture of synthetic uh, fertilizers. That's less well-known, but maybe it could be the most important because it was one of the key reasons that between 1870 and today, we've had a massive expansion of the human population from about 1 billion up to 8 billion today. And that population can be seen as divided into two groups those who have access to reliable, low-cost energy, and those who want to have access to it. Just another footnote, where are these people living? Not in the United States or Europe. You can see we are a world where most of the population lives in Asia. Africa is, is gaining on it. Latin America is growing rapidly. That is related to the ultimate issue we're concerned with, which is CO2 emissions. Back in 1981, CO2 emissions were basically a problem for the developed world, the OECD countries. They were about 70%. Currently, they're only about a third. By 2050, they're only gonna be about a quarter. So when we're talking about if our ultimate goal is CO2 emission control and reduction, we're talking about the developing world and India and China, most importantly. Why would these developing countries want to use fossil fuels? Well, there's a lot of advantages. The existing infrastructure, low extraction costs, low transport costs, high energy density, which is particularly critical for air travel and shipping, good safety record, and near perfect efficiency for uh, to produce heat for industrial and residential use. All this means that the world's going to be using fossil fuels for the next several decades. Are you willing to give up flying? Therefore, we need to work with fossil fuel companies to figure out how to use fossil fuels as efficiently as possible and to minimize the environmental impact. In this effort, the non-OECD countries are not going to not deny their people the benefits of low cost, uh, reliable energy and the associated economic growth it makes possible to achieve distant goals for CO2 concentration. As just one example, this is coal. The yellow dots show the where existing coal plants are to produce electricity. The pink dots show where new coal plants at the end of 2020 were under construction. See, none in, in America. That's really not our problem. The problem is the developing world needs energy more than they're concerned about CO2. So what do we do? This is the question that Evo Welsh and I asked in our book, what's a pragmatist approach to the fundamental question? And we believe that carbon pledges, ESG campaigns, and divestment in OECD countries are feel-good approaches that will have virtually no impact 
on global CO2 emissions. International agreements are bound to fail because the countries are going to put them, their own self-interest first. China's made this very clear. Therefore, Professor Welsh and I believe that the best way out, and universities could be a critical part of this, is subsidizing research and development in rich countries with the hope of making renewable energy sources as reliable and cost-effective as fossil fuels, and then giving that technology to developing countries. Maybe politically difficult, but critical. A central part of that research should be storage and transmission of electricity. There should also be active research in adaptation to rising temperatures. To an extent, we're going to use fossil fuels and temperatures will rise. How do we adapt? And finally, we need to investigate out-of-the-box alternatives such as fusion and solar radiation management. That basically is all I have to say. But as Steve Jobs would say, one more thing. Normative issues aside of whether or not we should divest, divestment has a fatal flaw. It won't work. It will not have a measurable impact on the prices of fossil fuel stocks or capital flows to fossil fuel companies because of competition in the capital market. And I offer as my number one example of that, Warren Buffett. Mr. Buffett invests where he thinks he can make the best risk-adjusted return for his, inv uh, his uh, investors in Berkshire, and he has now got permission to buy up to half of Occidental Petroleum. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. Uh, now um, go to Dan Cohn for the first opening remark of the <clears throat> Yes Divestment side. We see your slides there, Dan. Thank you very you much. Got my slides. Great. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for having me. Uh, today, I'll be arguing that divestment is warranted because the coal, oil, and gas industries have lost their financial rationale. Fossil fuels are no longer this, uh, the stable, profitable, or growing sector that they once were, as Brad spoke to, and institutional investors have little reason to expect steady blue chip returns going forward. Uh, what this means is that university trustees should carefully consider whether they can meet their financial targets without fossil fuels in the portfolio, and I'll lay out three points as to why I believe they can. First, energy has significantly underperformed the market for the last decade, so there's no obstacle to finding replacement investments. Second, the sector faces unprecedented competition that makes for volatile prices and shrunken market share. We'll talk about both of those, I'm sure. Third, there's astoundingly little on offer in terms of new technologies to secure fossil fuels place in a low carbon future. There's really just a void of viable innovation. But first, underperformance. Historically, oil and gas was among the most valuable sectors in the stock market. It contributed to the development of modernity as we know it. Back in 1980, it commanded 29% of the S&P 500, but its prominence has eroded to a low of near 2% in 2020, and it's only up to 4.5% today. If you take a broad market index like the MSCI World, you can see that a fossil-free version, which is in blue, uh, consistently outpaces the benchmark for the last 12 years. This means that fossil fuels actually dragged down investment returns. And you'll see why if you look at 10 years of returns from the S&P 500 in blue versus energy constituents in yellow, Energy gained only a ninth of what the overall market returned over the last decade. I'm going to skip this slide. Um, now, there has been an increase in the price of oil since the lows of the pandemic. This is due largely to the emergence from lockdowns and Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Both of those factors are unsustainable from a financial perspective. So the question is, why has oil gone from leading financial markets in 1980 and before to lagging them today? In a word, it's competition from both within and outside the industry. The energy sector's profitability depends in large part on commodity prices, but prices tanked in 2014 and 15 due to the advent of fracking and the resulting increase in oil and gas supply. This hurt the entire industry, and the lack of coordination between the frackers and OPEC poses a serious risk that prices will remain quite volatile going forward. We're seeing that right now, of course. Uh, big swings in price will result in unstable or negative returns to investors. There's also a slew of new technologies that are absorbing growth and market share across fossil fuels chief end markets. The power sector consumes more than a third of natural gas and 90% of coal here in the US, but through 2026, electric utilities are investing in six megawatts of new wind and solar for every megawatt of new fossil energy. And projections for battery storage during that time see today's six gigawatts growing to nearly 60, six zero during that timeframe. 
That will firm up a lot of variable generation, protect the grids in times of low renewable output, and further endanger the role of gas and coal. Uh, in transportation, you have the CEO of ExxonMobil running down the block saying that all new passenger vehicles will be electric in 2040. I don't know what more to say except that gasoline and diesel make up two thirds of US oil consumption and a little less than that globally. Then there's petrochemicals, uh, which are seen as a new profit center for oil and gas, but there's very little to suggest that they can replace lost demand from the transport and power sectors. Uh, finally, innovation or the lack thereof. There is very little on offer from the oil and gas industry to ensure it has a place in a low carbon future. The main event, of course, has been carbon capture and sequestration, which was never intended to be a climate solution, and it still isn't one now. Started off as a way to sell gas for marginal deposits and get more oil out of declining fields, but after decades of work adapting the tech for power plants, you have a string of failed projects that never got built, and the ones that did have consistently failed to meet their CO2 capture targets. There may be a role for direct air capture or some industrial applications, but power plant retrofits are not commercially viable today, and no one can really say if they ever will be. Uh, for time's sake, I'll pass over the proliferation of lawsuits against oil and gas producers. Um, and just say that the bottom line is this, it's really a basic financial lesson. That is, forget the glory days because past results do not indicate future returns. And really, you don't have to just take this from me, right? Globally significant investors who collectively manage $40 trillion have already divested from fossil fuels, including recently Princeton University. When you're a fiduciary at one of these institutions, you're legally beholden to manage money prudently, right? With care, skill, caution, and a long-term view. When you become aware of an investment risk, you have to do your due diligence and then act to protect your fund. So when deciding to divest, these fiduciaries at these institutions had to carefully consider fossil fuels recent returns. And they also considered the industry's negative long-term outlook, which to recap, uh, consists of underperformance, vo uh, volatile prices from a lack of coordination between global producers, uh, loss of market share, and no commercially viable low carbon technology. Instead, the industry has been relying on political interventions like Putin's war to pump up prices. That is all to say it has uh, lost its financial rationale. And so for university trustees, I think the question is uh, not why divest, but really why stay in fossil fuels at all. I will leave it there and look over to the rest of the discussion. Thank you, Dan. Good timing. So we will now go back to the no divestment side and finish up with Brent. Bennett, Texas Public Policy Foundation. Uh, Brad is sharing the slide for him. Brad, we see a presenter view. Okay. <clears throat> well, while, while Brad's getting that fixed, uh, no, thank you, Carrie, and I appreciate the opportunity to, to uh, do this. It's really in politics in the world that I live in, a lot of public debate, quote unquote, is throwing talking points at each other uh, in public venues. Um, a lot of the debate happens one-on-one -on -one in private. So it's really good to be in a public forum where we get to challenge each other's ideas and be challenged. I really appreciate that. Um, so I, I wanted to kind of counter what, uh, Dan said, oddly enough, and, and go back to the point that, uh, that Brad kind of made at the end, which is, um, the, the idea that divestment, divestment can create uh, excess returns, better returns, is really depends on the, how you look at it on your on a on a time frame. Fundamental financial theory says that as you if you reduce your investment universe, then you're going to incur more risk, which will lower your returns. And so a lot of times when people look at divestment, they do exactly what Dan did, which is just look at a, only maybe a 10 year time frame. And over 10, 20 years, you can see that sometimes you'll have industry sectors that outperform the broader market. But over the long term, when you're looking at 50, 60 years, um, that's not that's not always the case. And you're, you're almost always going to find that, you know, that divesting from an industry costs money. We even found this with tobacco over the course of the last 20 years. And you know, California has uh, recently come out with some data that uh, their pensions divesting from tobacco is costing quite a bit of money. So really, it's more a question in my mind of is the, is the cost of divestment worth the benefit that you get from it, right? And in this case, so assuming that reducing CO2 emissions is our goal, then what's the, where does the benefit come from? Well, the, the, the idea behind divestment is that you're reducing production of it, which then will, will increase prices and incur uh, switching to other fuels, right? The problem, the problem there is that really when we divest, we're only divesting from you know, public and some private uh, American and European companies. It's actually a small subset of the whole global environment that produces oil. Most of the companies are state-owned oil companies that produce oil in the world, um, Russia, Saudi Arabia, and so on. So we're only producing production of a portion of it. 
uh, which can have some effect, but it's not, it's not very great. Um, and second of all, the demand for energy can be very inelastic, right? So as we've seen over the last year and year and a half, even as prices have doubled for, um, for fossil fuels and, and more so for coal, coal is up four or five times now. Um, there's still a, there's demand for that is very inelastic because the substitutes for those fuels in most cases are very difficult, even for electric vehicles, for example, you know, we're seeing people, more people buying electric vehicles, but only at a slightly higher rate. And so, again, what you really have to get back to is not reducing production, but how can we reduce consumption of fossil fuels, right? That's really- 30 the seconds. Yeah, thank you. And, and so- Really, what that comes down to is: can we find can we find technologies that that will actually cause consumers to switch on their own from to you know other sources of energy, right? If they're cheaper enough, uh, can they can we make those fuels cheaper enough to in induce switching from customers? Because reduce because raising prices is only going to marginally decrease energy demand. People are always going to demand energy. So with that, then I'll uh, yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And now. We will go to the fourth before <clears throat> introductory remarks, this time from Cutler Cleveland, Boston University. Cutler, go ahead and share your screen and unmute yourself. No? You know, it's my first time on Zoom, so I forgot to there you go. the unmute button. <laughs> Thanks for the... Uh... Go ahead and share. All righty. Lost my share button here. Hang on one second. There we go. Okay, thanks for the opportunity to join this discussion. I, I speak from 10 years of experience of being involved in the divestment movement here at Boston University where uh, just last year, the board of trustees decided to uh, in fact divest from, from fossil fuels. So I'd like to begin with uh, a few of the common myths that we hear about divestment uh, and then talk about some of the uh, risks posed by not divesting. One of the most common uh, myths is that endowments should not be embroiled in politics. And that is, is simply ridiculous. Um, ignoring a moral issue at the core of climate change pe uh, presents real peril to the reputation of universities. Uh, marginalized populations bear the brunt of the economic and health impacts of climate, and that relationship holds true within and among nations. And the fact that climate change requires development of the capacity to manage our collective impact uh, means that universities have a duty to help foster this development. And universities cannot pretend that they have no such responsibility without forsaking the role that they have historically engendered as trustees of humanity's capacities, values, and understanding. The myth of low returns it just doesn't fly. Um, if you look at uh, most information that's generated not funded by fossil fuel industry themselves, both in the peer-reviewed journal and most recently last year by BlackRock, there simply is no penalty for divesting from fossil fuels. So that simply, that simply doesn't hold, hold weight. Another myth is that renewables are not, uh, are not ready. That also doesn't uh, hold weight. Here's some recent data by the, what's happening in the US showing that solar power and battery are gonna account for the majority of new investment. This doesn't even include wind. If you included wind, we'd be well up over 50% of new capacity being added. So renewables, wind and solar are already cheaper than coal and uh, as cheap as combined cycle natural gas in the United States not even uh, accounting for or subsidies. Professor Cornell spoke of, referred to what I call carbon humanitarianism. How can we possibly deny the benefits of what we've enjoyed that fossil fuels have brought on the hundreds of millions of people that rely on low quality fuels that wreak tremendous havoc on human well-being, particularly women and small, small children. But carbon humanitarian, carbon humanitarian is, is a myth for a number of reasons. First, it has a logical fatal flaw. The increased use of fossil fuel is deemed necessary to eliminate global poverty, yet the emissions of GHGs and other pollutants will cause changes in climates whose effects fall disproportionately on the very people that those fuels are supposed to help. 
Second, fossil fuels generate enormous costs as well as enormous benefits, but our economic and financial accounting systems are set up only to measure the benefits. This sends biased signals in the market. Third, carbon humanitarianism uh, presumes that fossil fuels are the only viable route to poverty alleviation. If one assumes there's no a, a priori, assumes there's no viable alternative, then one tends to adopt uh, Maslow's hammer. That is, if all you have is a fossil fuel hammer, then everything looks like a nail. Quickly, just to review some of the things that Dan said and add a few more in terms of the, the risks that aren't included in a lot of these calculations that you see. There's tremendous risk to reputation and brand for universities that don't engage in these issues. There's massive amounts of carbon assets in the ground that are already on people's books that may become stranded due to climate legislation and carbon pricing, and more likely just simply being out competed in the market. There's also a, a risk from reduced energy subsidies that have helped propped up at the energy industry. One noticeable example in the US is that all produced water in the oil and gas industry is exempt from the Clean Water Act due to uh, lobbying by the oil and gas industry. There's risk from the internalization of external costs that are happening around the world, principally in the form of carbon taxes. There's a risk from reduced exemption from environmental regulation, like the one I just mentioned. Every season, every proxy season, we see more and more shareholder advocacy demanding carbon companies to uh, deal with the climate change issue. And as Dan mentioned, there's tremendous risk associated with oil price volatility. We do not get with uh, renewable forms of energy, particularly in electricity markets. So I'll stop there and thanks for the opportunity again to engage on this important issue. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, everyone. So thanks to Brad, thanks to Cutler, thanks to Dan, and thanks to Brent for their opening remarks. Uh, so now I'll encourage each of you to have your microphone open as we go with a little bit of back and forth here. And uh, I will now open it up to Brent and Brad to follow up or pose a question or rebut anything said by uh, Dan and Cutler. Well, I have one thing, Brent, which <clears throat> one problem I have with this whole divestment thing is people run two very different issues together. One is it's a moral issue. For moral reasons, the CO2 emissions are damaging, uh, the fossil fuel companies are responsible, and we've just got to divest. The other is we, we divesting is a financial good thing. Those are very separate. I don't think either one works in the final point, but Dan was stressing a lot of the financial performance and Cutler was stressing the normative issue. So I think we need to keep those straight. I would just add that I think the idea that divestment can create greater returns is basically an assumption that the market doesn't have all this stuff already priced in. The things that Cutler just mentioned, um, there's an assumption that somehow the markets aren't functioning correctly to put this into existing stock prices. Um, so I think that's, that's a question that has to be asked when you're talking about uh, divestment. I would actually argue the opposite, that because of public perception that the markets are actually tending to underprice fossil fuel stocks right now um, because of how much they've declined, they haven't gone up as much as I think they should have to come back to where they should be. So again, it's kind of a, it's, but it's a question again, am I smarter than the market? Is any particular university or their endowment smarter than the market in terms of how stocks are being priced right now? Uh, history says that the answer is probably no. And, you know, just to follow up with, with your point in your slide, Brent, <clears throat> whatever the optimal holdings of fossil fuel companies are from an investment point, I actually even help run an investment firm. And we ask this question every day. But I can tell you, it's not zero. Normatively, it might be zero. But there's got to be in a well-diversified portfolio some role for fossil fuel stocks or you're not optimally diversified. Okay, well, let's dig into there. Go ahead, Dan. Um, Cutler, go ahead. <clears throat> um, got a whole thing, a slew of things to respond to. I think um, let's start with uh, the reflection of the risks in prices. The only way that I see that the market is really pricing in the long term risks to fossil fuels is when you compare the energy sector's weight 
today to its weight over time, right? It's no longer at the 5, 10, or 15% of the market like it was for many years. That's a sign that long-term investors have lost a significant amount of interest. Now, these days, the kind of that kind of information is mostly ignored, I think, um, and the news about the industry's outperformance in the last two years is really focused on oil and gas stock prices that have risen from truly depressed levels. Um, uh, you know, <clears throat> uh, that movement up from a range of what was it, two percent to about four and a half percent, seems much more tightly correlated to the short-term outlook for profits and for commodity prices. Um, this sort of short-term focus on prices is evident in statements from industry leaders, right? Who say that there's no support for increasing production from investors uh, despite high prices because investors want their money back. You know, the industry is responding to investor sentiment that has been coming from, you know, investors such as uh, Kimmeridge, uh, which have been castigating shale for wasting so much investment capital for so many years. Um, so I don't think that we can expect prices to uh, accurately reflect the long term here when investors are looking for short term returns are getting them in stock buybacks and dividends and stock prices are reflecting that directly. Yeah, um, I there, Dan, just on that on that point, the notion that markets send appropriate signals is just patently absurd. If you look at even conservative think tanks and conservative economists in places like the IMF and the World Bank, hardly bastions of the divestment movement estimate the, the externalities associated with fossil fuel production and use in the trillions of dollars. The IMF estimates subsidies to fossil fuels at trillions of dollars. The market is incredibly distorted. So the notion that we're somehow making optimal decisions on information the market sends simply cannot be defended. And if I could uh, chime in again on something that uh, was kind of the essence of Brad's point. Um, there was a point you made, Brad, about the lack of impact, right? I think your sort of overall point was that divestment will not have impact, uh, a financial impact. And so if that is so, if there are no financial impact from divestment at all, then why would fossil fuel titans like Shell, Peabody Energy, and Exxon issue warnings to investors about it, right? Like when you read their 10Ks, they say that climate activism and divestment is a material risk. Uh, it's a risk to their access to capital. Um, if you don't mind, I'd like to quote from Exxon here. Uh, in their 2021 annual report, they say, political and other actors and their agents increasingly seek to advance climate change objectives indirectly, such as by seeking to reduce the availability or increase the cost of financing and investment in the oil and gas sector and taking actions intended to promote changes in business strategy for oil and gas companies. Depending on how policies are formulated, I lost my spot, um, uh, such policies could negatively affect our investment returns, make our hydrocarbon-based products more expensive or less competitive, lengthen project implementation times, and reduce demand for hydrocarbons, as well as shift hydrocarbon demand towards relatively lower carbon alternatives. Um, I would just want to say that the, the divestment movement is not the sole answer to climate change, right? The divestment movement is essentially a, you know, what it is pushing fiduciaries to do is to take a defensive stance against a sector that used to lead financial markets and is no longer doing so. Um, and, you know, it is, it is defending the value of the portfolios against the risk that the companies themselves are identifying. Okay. Thank you, Dan, for going straight into posing a question to the other side. So, uh, Brad and Brent, response to Dan's point. Well, let me just say one thing about the disclosures. I've worked as an expert witness in many litigations involving finance. The SEC and the lawyers are going to make you disclose every possible risk. And you know there is some risk there, but as far as the market pricing, this is where I would agree with Mr. Buffett. In our firm, we looked very carefully in the last year of the price of a company's stock versus the present value of its expected cash flows. And on that basis, the, the, the two best investments we made were Exxon and Chevron. So it depends on price versus outlook. Sorry, I was muted. And I'll just add that, um, you know, the, the part of the reason that uh, particularly American companies are so concerned about divestment is because divestment can have a localized impact on those companies, right? If you get enough people to not buying their stock, that can definitely affect their stock price negatively. So the companies, those companies are very concerned about it. But if you look at the global uh, energy market as a whole, it has almost no impact. And a lot of times that, that you know, reducing the production or output of American companies will just increase at some production somewhere else, unless we're changing consumption patterns. 
right? And so again, that depends on the effect on prices, which as I said before, I think we've seen how inelastic energy demand is in response to prices. There is some effect, but not much. Carrie, can I jump back in? Uh, thank you, yeah. Any response from Dan? Yeah, I, I think, can I, if you don't mind if I just jump in here a bit, Dan, I, I think to step back a bit and connect this from divestment writ large to the topic of the debate, which is the university and why universities should divest. And, you know, the what eventually won the day at BU, and we have a pretty conservative board, what eventually won the day is the need to align everything that the university does. So we're a university that has a, a large number of degrees with environment or energy or sustainability in their title at the bachelor, master's and PhD level. We have lots of faculty engaged in climate change research and sustainability from the business school to the school of theology. We have a very active campus sustainability program. We've committed to be net zero by 2040. And we literally built a wind farm in South Dakota to offset our emissions. And so then for the university to say, oh, but here's this $2 billion sitting over here behind this curtain that no one wants, that we can't talk about, just was increasingly untenable given everything else that the university was doing and given the fact of what climate change is doing to the planet. And so it, that argument in, in the end of the day had a lot of weight with the board of trustees. Also given the fact that their own research said, well, divesting is not gonna improve performance, but it's not gonna hurt us because there just isn't any evidence that that's the case. Okay. Um... Short, short follow-up from you, Dan, and then we'll let the other side. Yeah, go. yeah, great. I mean, I think I just want to respond to the point about uh, about prices, right, and price structure. You know, the, the industry claims that it's back, right? It's it's outperforming the market these last two years. It was the uh, worst performing sector for five of the last 12 years and it underperformed the market in eight of those. Um, what the industry needs to be profitable is high prices, right? And so my question is, do you guys believe that the industry has a sustainable price model? I just want to submit that prices today are uh, heavily impacted by global bottlenecks, the you know emergence out of the pandemic, and also the war in Russia. The, the price of oil jumped eight dollars a barrel on February twenty fourth, right? Um, so fossil fuels are in a bit of a bind, right? Low prices they can't make money. High prices, uh, um, you know, they enhance the uh, incentive to find replacements um, and. Uh, that sort of undercuts their long-term viability. So I, I want to zero in on that one, if you guys don't mind. Uh, to Brad and Brent to respond to either of Cutler's comments about the difference of universities, since this is a debate about technically uh, university uh, endowments and what's the difference between that and another any other investment, and then follow up on Dan's well, point as well. It's hard to respond to Cutler and Dan because they're making the two different arguments that I spoke of. Cutler is really talking about what can't the separate price. the two. You can't separate the two. Come on. Well, what suppose, you, it's an artificial division. It's an artificial division. Well, suppose that I believe that Exxon is dramatically underpriced because of, as Brent said, all this anti-fossil fuel stuff. So, and we did it at our investment firm. We believed it was underpriced. So we bought Exxon while simultaneously thinking that we need policies like a carbon tax in this country. To, and not only in this country, but in China and India and Africa to address CO2 emissions. So I think they are somewhat distinct. You, you want to invest in what's a good deal from a risk adjusted return point of view. And then as a citizen, you want to set government policies so that we optimally transition to a new form of energy, because ultimately we're going to have to. Even the most pro fossil fuel people realize this is a couple centuries. And hopefully we're going to be on this planet more than a couple of centuries. Um, further? I'll, I'll go back to Dan's point. I think the, the problem there is he continues to use kind of the last decade to 12 years time frame when looking at this issue. I would say even now, after the run up that that uh, energy stocks have had, fossil fuel stocks have had, they're still, um, you know, they, they still haven't caught up right to the rest of the market, given how much given how depressed they were over the course of the last decade. But you got to look at it on a longer time scale than that, particularly as a, as a pension or a university endowment, right? They're, you're investing for 20 to 
40 years or more, right? Um, and over that time, so over that time, what is your investment philosophy? Now, maybe you think that you can beat the market and kind of switch sectors over time. Some people think that, but I'm, I'm not a believer in that. I think that you have to remain broadly diversified. Uh, and again, you, you know, if you go back to, you know, other examples of declining industries like tobacco, uh, you divest from those, you're still losing returns because you're increasing volatility of your portfolio. So I think it's, I think it goes back to what kind of what color says there's a cost to it. Uh, in my opinion, I think there's fundamentally a cost to it. And what is, so there, well, therefore, what is the corresponding benefit, right? And you have to realize, Brett, that Warren Buffett's, my examples are pretty good. He's been for 40 or 50 years considered one of the world's great investors trading off risk and return, and he's bought 50% of an oil company. Right. I mean, the case, um, so many, these are great points, guys. So many things to respond to. Um, uh, let's see. So, Brent, to your point about a more than more than a 10-year time frame, how long should a fiduciary look at? Should a fiduciary go back to the 19th century to see that the contributions to modernity from fossil fuels are the basis for what should be done investment-wise in the 21st century? I mean, Fiduciary should be looking forward, right? Not backwards. And when you look forward, you have to acknowledge that there is a immense slew of risks, price volatility, new competition. You know, I mean, so don't also don't misconstrue me like fossil fuels are going to be around for a long time. Uh, they're going to be used in even an unabated fashion for probably longer than the climate uh, than they should be for climate reasons. I admit all of that. Um, the, the problem is that, you know, they never experience the level of competition that they're seeing right now. We have viable industries in wind, solar, batteries, EVs, this sort of um, uh, critical mass of technological innovation that is coming down the cost curve and continues to post lower costs despite the sort of pandemic wrinkles, right? Um, I wanna just address carbon tax too. I mean, relying on a carbon tax is great from a theoretical point of view, but I'm sorry, Brad, it's dead on arrival in Washington. The oil companies know that, the climate movement knows that. That's why the oil companies continue to pursue it and rhetorically support it. And the climate industry has kind of given up, right? Um, and I had something else I wanted to get to. Um, well, I'm sure I'll come back up. That's right. I'll just go to Cutler if he has uh, initial thoughts before we go to the other response. I, I agree with Dan that showing these long time curves are are really, you know, they're informative, but as fiduciaries for universities also have not only, they have a, a, a responsibility of care as well. And this, in, the impact that climate change is gonna have on future generations, they are required by law under the duty of care requirement to be considering these, uh, the, these factors. And I noticed that, but, uh, Brent and, and Brad, in your papers, all your series ended 2013 or 2014. You don't, you don't even have last 10 years worth of data. So come on, if you're, if you're gonna look at the whole record, let's look at the whole record and things are rapidly changing. And we're going through a very rapid structural change in the economy, driven in part by the change in the energy system. So there's no reason necessarily to believe that the past is the guide to the future. We'll go with a response from Brad and Brent, and then I'll try to ask a question from the audience. Yeah, I would I would agree that the past is not a guide for the future, but also again, it comes down to question of uh, as a, as a university endowment um, you know investor, are you are you do you think you can out guess I guess the market in this? Is there like as you said, is there a flaw somehow in the market that's under that's causing pri the prices currently not to reflect future cash flows as they should be? Right. And I would just I, I think that's I think the case that even with all the distortions in the markets, markets are still the best way to guess that. And as an individual university trying to outguess that is fundamentally going to cost you money. Um, the, the other point I would say is that you know, this idea that we are that we are transitioning away from fossil fuels, you know, in the last decade, about decade or so, the U.S. consume is on track to consume as many fossil as much fossil fuels this year about as we did a decade ago. What we've really done with wind and solar is add another four to five percent. And Kerry talks about this a lot in his writing about you know energy demand has been pretty flat in the U.S. for the last you know ten plus years. But really, what we've done is is add a little four or five percent of wind and solar on top of what we already consuming. It, Europe has done a little more, but again, it's it's I, I have not I have traditionally what I've seen is that. When you add new energy sources, it tends to add to our consumption because, again, people aren't going to accept less energy consumption. So I think that um, the idea that somehow fossil fuels are inherently at risk in the near term in any investment horizon, 
uh, is, is not correct. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you on that, Brent. And, and in particular, just look at the energy consumption data for the United States. It's still 70, 80% fossil fuels. We will have to transition away. We'll, we, we will need wise policies to transition away. It's going to take decades. The high energy density means we can't give up air, air travel. So my view is that we need to work with the fossil fuel companies to transition toward new energy sources, not make them bad guys and, and have these, these show divestitures. We just invest the best way we can for our students and our faculty. And we elect politicians and, and uh, experts to address the, at a public policy level, the energy transition problem. So, so okay. Brent and Brad, I'm still with a short one. I'm going to get to a question from the audience. Yeah, no, sure. Go, go ahead. Go. No, let's go to the audience. Okay. That's All right. Uh, wait, can I jump in before the audience? Have... Okay, go for 20 seconds. Great points being made. Um, Brent, you're referring to California uh, losing money on tobacco. Have you seen what the results were from their thermal coal divestments? Marginally positive, 18 basis points. Um, in terms of the question of whether we can work with these companies, to improve the energy outlook, Brad, there's no evidence uh, um, that you know these companies are at all interested in being worked with, right? People say, let's be patient. They've gotten the message. They'll come around. The brunt of any progress we've made in decarbonizing the economy has only been achieved in the face of active opposition. They're committing their capital as they always have with a lion's share to upstream uh, and petrochemicals refining, not to low carbon businesses, right? Their all time high last year was 5% of CapEx globally. Um, that figure also includes CCS, hydrogen biofuels that don't really present much of a commercial opportunity uh, going forward. Um, uh, and let's just let's cut it cut it there. We yeah. certainly have uh, closing remarks where people can make their favorite points at the end. But I'd like to get to some one or a few of the questions the nice audience has been uh, submitting. So here's one that we're obviously talking about universities in general. Here, but as a student at a university, um, we had uh, heard various arguments about financial returns and maybe some moral implications. But should this decision be made in lieu of how it affects students, or how would you think the divestment of university endowments affects students in terms of how universities are funded, partly from university endowments? So I will go first with uh, Cutler and Dan, and then second, uh, Brent and Brad. I think you know students. That, in, that I teach. And I, it's a biased sample, admittedly, because I'm in a part of Earth and environment um, where we have a lot of students who are gonna go out work mostly in the private sector related in doing energy consulting of some sort. But students overwhelmingly know that the defining issues of their generation are climate change and equity, both within and between countries. So universities absolutely have a responsibility to take the, the, the conditions of future life into consideration when they decide how to invest their endowments. It is part of their legal responsibility under the duty of care part of their, uh, their pact. So students are the beneficiaries of investment funds, right? Uh, of, of endowments, right? Um, and as a student, I would uh, I actually was <laughs> upset that uh, my university was investing in a set of industries um, that now we see uh, uh, they could have gotten a, a better deal yeah, by just investing in the market, right? That was the point of that blue and uh, yellow chart I showed. For 12 years, uh, despite the recent upturn in prices, a fossil free portfolio has outperformed a uh, the, the standard benchmark. So um, from a purely self-interested perspective on what kinds of laboratories get built and how much tuition is, uh, or whether you've even wasted alumni money if we bring former students into that conversation, um, their you know, divestment should be considering not just today's students, but also the many future generations of students, right? We have to make this energy transition uh, for the benefit of the universities and students. And realistically, that is gonna mean zeroing out fossil fuel use in the future. Um, we're already seeing the industry in trouble. So, you know, now is a fine time to go ahead and cut the cord. Thank you, Dan, uh, Brent and Brad. Uh, response to thinking about students and the impact on them. 
Well, I, I think this investment question comes into play here. In my view, if I was investing money for Boston University or the University of Texas, I would want to do that as effectively as possible from a risk-adjusted return point of view. Let me just share the screen for one second. You may want to leave this up to a friend. We talked about data. This is from Yahoo Finance. The, uh, the you don't price see it. I see it. Oh, so I didn't hit the share button. Can you see it now? Go for it. Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, this is the price of Exxon for the last five years. At the investment firm that I work at, it, we felt that when Exxon got down below $40, this was just a smoking deal. Had I been on the board of trustees at Boston University, I would have said from a finance point of view, we want to be buying fossil fuel co companies now. The question is, should that be overridden for some normative or ethical viewpoint? Well, my view that's is not why they not. decided. That's not why they decided to divest, Brad. That's not why they decided. They all look. They're not a bunch of dummies here, right? They're looking at the same information you are. They just. They're not looking at just this. That's the whole point. We're a university. We need to think larger and longer term, not just short, short run returns for our our shareholders. Well, and that's that's why I'm saying there is this dichotomy. And which point are we debating? There's the point whether. The trust, whether the, the investors should go for the best risk adjusted return or whether they should weigh something else, some normative or ethical consideration and give up some return if necessary. But again, there's no, you don't give up return. That's the whole point. They looked at this, look at the BlackRock study, look at all these other studies done by investment firms and that have happened since 2015. And when you wrote many of your papers, you don't suffer. You do not, you don't necessarily perform better, maybe in some cases, but you don't suffer. So you can achieve this normative uh, output of your dis wanting to divest without suffering returns for your share stakeholders. Well, whether or not you suffer depends on the price of the stock. If, you, if you'd bought it back here, you wouldn't have suffered. But if you forego the opportunity to buy it when the market looks like it's cheap, when Mr. Buffett is buying, then you, I think you're going to hurt your, your students. Uh, Brent, anything to add on this? I would just say BlackRock themselves is not, a, as a company, is not in favor of divestment. They are very much on the side of stay invested in companies and then use their voting power to direct investment in those companies. I mean, they're, they're kind of in the mindset that uh, companies should be investing according to what's coming in the future, but that a financial company or a, or a pension or endowment uh, divesting now, yeah, maybe if not, maybe in in depending on your time scale, depending on um, your particular university portfolio, you might not be able, you might not lose a whole lot. But if you look at it as a whole, again, divestment is going to cost you some money, and BlackRock consistently says that in in everything that they do. Um, that particular that's, study that's not done, true, Brent. Yeah, what, no, the, the, that particular study, that 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 study that was, was, you know, Brett Keller talked about, you know, um, that particular study was done for. Um, you know, uh, to you know, several entities that are looking to divest. They're they're giving their clients a kind of a reason mm -hmm. to do it, what they wanted to do, anyways. And so I would argue that there's probably some flaws. I haven't read the study, but again, they're well. They're you can't if you don't say it's flawed, they haven't read it. When you yeah, look at it on the whole, here's the thing with the study. The study Thirty seconds, Dan. Yeah, 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 yeah. sides of their mouths. BlackRock will say we're not in favor of divestment, and then when their clients ask them, "Is this fiduciarily responsible to do?" They'll look at the data honestly. And so that's what that study says. It says exactly. that when you look at the data, it is honestly, uh, uh, you, are, you are not going to have extraordinary fees. You're not going to see underperformance. And, you know, they did that under contract. They were an investment advisor. This was a study for the City of New York pension funds. Uh, the comptroller's office asked for professional investment advice. That's what the RFP said. And so if they're going to sit there and, and give uh, false answers, that is not a particularly good business model. All right, I'm going to go to another question from the audience. And depending on how it goes, this might be it before closing remarks. Uh, there are time constraint. Thank you, everyone. So here's a, a question. If a university does not divest from fossil fuels in their endowment, does the university have any other power to dictate the speed and engagement at which oil and gas companies, or let's just say fossil fuel companies in general, uh, play a part in the in a low carbon transition, which is to say, what is there a linkage of meaningful linkage between the university's investment 
uh, strategy or reasons for doing it and the engagement with potentially researchers on campus with oil and gas industry or high fossil fuel industry. So we'll start with uh, Brad and Brent and then go to Cutler and Dan. Well, this your remark, Kerry, goes directly to what Evo and I say in our book. Universities can play a huge role. We've got a tremendous problem of providing reliable, low-cost energy for 8 billion people globally. There's umpteen research issues that need to be addressed, and that's where universities ought to be focused, in my view. Yeah, I would, and I would say, yeah, I mean, universities can can most adequately spend their money in and using their endowments to impact uh, technology development of low carbon technologies. Um, divesting, divesting again is it may not cost you a lot of money, but you're also not going to have a big impact unless you get again, unless there's policy drivers, unless there's um, you know other companies, the entire investment industry is getting behind that because even then you're only impacting um, really invest the investable universe of American and European Western companies and not the state owned oil companies that produce a lot of the world's oil and gas. So it's, um, so I think it's, that's the biggest impact that universities can have. Yeah. And, yeah. I totally and, agree, Brent. and, and so, and, and, um, you know, doing otherwise is, is just not really going to have an impact. Again, we, we still, as, as even in the U.S., we still are, are not really ma materially changing our consumption of fossil fuels uh, over the last decade plus, even as we're adding a little bit of wind and solar. So forget the sideshow and get down to the hard work of figuring out a way to, to manage the energy transition. That's what universities ought to do. Okay, thanks. And now the response from Dan and Cutler on... In the general engagement of universities with uh, fossil fuel companies and divestment. Go ahead. Go ahead, Dan. Yeah, sure. So um, if the question is, you know, what can the university do to uh, support and assist the energy transition? Clearly the research programs and, and uh, you know, gearing bright minds who want to figure out how to make this planet a livable and habitable place in their lifetimes is a, a perfect role. I'm going to say, there are lots of people who will say that, in fact, universities should join the um, uh, group of investors who are trying to engage with the fossil fuel industry to change their fundamental business model. Now, I'm gonna, I wanna throw some cold water on that. If you listen to the chief investment officer of CalSTRS, right, the California Teachers Fund, uh, he led the charge at Exxon last year, right? Uh, at, at Exxon last year at the shareholders meeting, they elected three new board members with a climate sort of thermal climate slate to the board. Um, and last December, six months later, he got on and did an interview where he said basically that management is is sidelining these people. Uh, they are not integrating them. And that's been basically the response that the industry has uh, has played. So I'm, I want to just insert that there. Um, engaging the fossil fuel industry as an investor, not very helpful. In terms of policy drivers, I mean, we did just pass federal legislation to build a new, uh, several new supply chains in this country. Um, there are plenty of companies that are ready to scale up their investment. We're going to, you know, have some bumpy supply constraints on critical minerals and such like, but there actually is now facilitative policy. Um, in terms of the state-owned companies, uh, it sounds like you're making a bit of a geopolitical argument, maybe, uh, Brent, like, you know, um, it, we're going to get sort of worse ownership of the fossil fuel industry from bad actors like Russia and Saudi Arabia. Unfortunately, the oil and gas industry has funneled profits to auto state uh, to to um, petrostate autocrats for decades, and you know the industry spent a lot of that money manipulating politics around the globe. So it's been wildly destabilizing. And in fact, we have viable industries now that are moving uh, slowly, as you're saying, to to displace the use of fossil fuels and make obsolete what they sell. Um, I'm sorry. One more point: uh, not all state-owned companies are not publicly traded, right? You have a bunch of Russian companies, uh, I think Gazprom and Rosneft, for example, uh, Sergei Neftegas, um, Saudi Aramco, parts of Saudi Aramco are publicly traded, also parts of Coal India are publicly traded. So I just wanted to make that point from before. Okay, any follow-up from Brent and Brad? Otherwise, we'll continue on. All right, so we- Last question, yeah. So go ahead. Just, I mean, want to add my two cents on that, la that last point about engaging the industry, because I was asked that very question by a member of the Board of Trustees this past week, uh, who said, 
was looking at some recent work done on carbon capture and storage and sequestration and the industry working on this and saying, well, shouldn't we leave, shouldn't we, you know, leave the have the board leave an option open to re-engage in the subject of divestment as conditions change? And what did I think about that? So here's what I said to him. I said, I'd be happy to, to engage in that if the following. There was a commitment to a rapid and deep investment in carbon capture and storage to sort the wheat from the chaff, both technologically and economically. A commitment to a rapid and deep investment in zero carbon sources with third party verification of what those investments actually are. A, a plausible roadmap to ramp down long lived upstream investments. A commitment to cease disinformation campaigns and blocking legislation that would accelerate the energy transition and internalize market externalities. And a commitment to behave in a socially and environmentally responsible manner in developing nations where scrutiny is often lag lacking and the record of multinationals is simply uh, horrendous. And finally, just on all those fronts, a commitment to full and tra transparency across the board. Show us the data that you're actually behaving in these ways. And if those kind, if that can information can be forthcoming, then we, I think, have a way to continuing to to have a dialogue about divestment at universities in a meaningful way. All right, thank you, Cutler. So, uh, due to our schedule here at the Energy Symposium, we're roughly out of time, and I'd like to move on to any final closing arguments. Although what Cutler said might have been considered part of that. Um, yeah, that, was, that was mine, uh, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> that's your closing argument. So, okay, we'll consider that Cutler's and uh, you and Dan were first to do closing arguments. So, Dan, is there any other just kind of summary statements or emphases that you would like to give as we wrap up? Yeah, um, I, I think I just want to reiterate some of the things I said. You know, universities should be investing for financial return. We clearly agree on that point. Uh, and I think we clearly disagree on what the prospect is for the industry um, I've tried to present things as a rational institutional investor should be looking at them. They should be asking, what does my investment in fossil fuels mean if I, you know, make it and hold it? Um, and the overall point is that the structure of the fossil fuel industry has dramatically changed. Its markets have changed. Um, and this really once important industry used to be a leader of the S&P 500. It's now in a weakened position. So expectations that of, of a repeat of 20th century performance in the 21st are, are you know, are likely to go unfulfilled. Um, I don't think that my opponent, my opponents have shown today that fossil fuels do have a viable long-term financial rationale. Uh, their arguments are mainly about speculating on uh, market inefficiencies in terms of what uh, Brad was saying about the underpricing of, um, of Exxon and Chevron stock. Um, you know, as an, institution, as an institutional investor, you have an exceptionally high duty to be careful with your investments. You can't ignore obvious glaring risks to your portfolio. You can't justify investments on a price structure that rests atop the unsteady foundation of war and geopolitical manipulation. Um, and I think that's especially true when, as in the case of fossil fuels, the sector in question faces uh, price instability, ferocious competition from price advantaged newcomers. And we didn't really get to this point, but no commercially viable low carbon technology. The future of energy uh, appears to be in solar wind, electric vehicles, batteries, and overhauled grid. Um, and it is hard to imagine a profitable future for fossil fuels in the face of these risks when they seem to be unwilling to come to the table. Um, I'd like to make one more point, if you don't mind, Carrie, which is that it's not really fair that institutional investors have to take these steps, right? Like, I just want to be clear about that. Uh, we do not have a politically managed energy transition. You guys have admitted that we're going to need to make the transition, and that's great. I think we agree on that. Um, but unfortunately, the world we live in is one where we have uh, bitter and acrimonious political debate over the speed of the transition and and what its effects will be. You know, we have very few provisions for fossil fuel workers who are going to be displaced. Those clearly need to be part of the conversation. Um, there, you know, it's I won't go into the decline in oil and gas jobs in Texas. Um, but I think for institutional investors, because we have no political uh, superstructure to be having this debate in, um, you know, fiduciaries, CEOs, uh, university trustees have to take on a leadership position, right? They're dealing with unforeseen challenges every day and uh, stepping up to the plate and helping facilitate and protect their institution in the energy transition is one of those things that we they just have to do. Um, Dan, can we cut it there? Yeah. 
Thanks, okay. Carrie, for having us. I appreciate everyone, everyone's time and energy today. You bet. All right. So closing remarks from Brent and Brad, and then everyone will have to answer the post-debate survey. So please stay on. Go ahead, uh, Brent and Brad. You want me to go first, Brent? Yeah, sure. My point is a simple one. The divestment movement is a moralistic sideshow that's, first of all, not going to work. And, and what we really need to do is we need to leave investment to people like Mr. Buffett, who attempt to get, all things considered, the best risk-adjusted return they can for their faculty, students, and university. That's one side. On the other side, the universities have to be a critical part of doing fundamental research <clears throat> that will be required for a very complicated long-term energy transition. And the investors will have to take account of that but they should still be maximizing risk-adjusted returns. Yeah, and I'll just say that I we haven't talked much. I, Dan is right; we didn't address very much the question of you know is there a future for the fossil fuel industry? I absolutely believe there is. Um, I absolutely believe that. Um, again, the the history of energy shows that when we add new energy sources, we generally just add to uh, energy consumption. We don't consume less coal now than we did in 1960, even though coal is now by far not the dominant fuel uh, source of fuel in the world. We consume more coal than we did then. Um, I would, I think, I think that most, um, you know, if you ask a lot of energy systems people like Carrie, unless uh, Carrie has a, a different view on kind of the the scope of of the, the finiteness of the world and our resources, but um, again. That's, I think that what we're doing is we're adding more energy sources. We're really just consuming more energy. We're not going to consume less fossil fuels. Uh, and that generally speaking, um, if we're going to reduce emissions, they have to come from reducing emissions of the fossil fuels that we consume, uh, capture or something like that. Uh, the, other, the only other way to do it would be to, again, have a, a source like nuclear, a low carbon source like nuclear that can actually effectively replace fossil fuels, which I don't think wind and solar can. So I think that is important to, to bring that up. And again, markets, I'll make my final point again. I think markets are the best place, even, as, even distorted markets are the best place to incorporate all this information into prices. Uh, and so at any, if, you know, at any one point, uh, if you're looking at if you're looking at the market, the market is taking in the best information. Sometimes you can now guess the market, but over the course of 30, 40, 50 years, you're not likely going to as a as a as a public pension or university. So okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for being a part of this debate. Uh, we've now concluded the discussion part of the debate, but the audience's work is not done. Um, the audience uh, should please. Uh, answer the post-debate survey here on answering the question that is under debate for us now. And that question, again, is in the chat for people to see in Zoom, or uh, you can use the QR code here with your phone if you're viewing. And we, I will thank our participants here who will hang on with us as myself and my assistant um, wait for the results to come in and tally them here behind the scenes. Uh, so we will just have a few minutes of rough silence while we do this, but please answer, answer this survey. And we will, I will come back in two or three minutes. After. Carrie, did we have the pre-debate results? They will, I will show both. I will show the pre-debate results and then the post-debate results. And then the, in the Oxford style debate, the quote unquote winner of the debate is the one that switches the percentage of votes towards their side more than the switch uh, to the other side. So that is the, way I will present the results here in a few minutes. Yeah. All right, so everyone please answer the survey and we will be back here in a few minutes. Thank you.
Okay, thank you everyone for waiting for us to tabulate the results. Uh, I just get a confirmation. You see see my screen with the slides from Brent or someone that's online here just to get a confirmation showing. Yeah, you bet. Okay, thank you. All right, so here was the question that was up for debate uh, again today. Uh, given the educational and research missions of universities, should university endowments divest from companies that extract, transport, refine, or sell fossil fuels? And as asked before, we have the pre-debate results. Uh, I'm going to show the post-debate results and then the percentage change uh, from the pre- and post-debate. So before the debate started, or at the beginning, 40% of the votes were for yes to answering these questions for divestment, 54% were for no, uh, did, do not divest, and 6% were I don't know. And now we have tabulated the results uh, after the debate, and we have the following results. We have 65% is now yes for uh, the yes to the answer to the question, divestment, 32% is no on the question of divestment, and 3% is I don't know. So if you calculate the change in percentage, uh, it is a 24, almost 25% gain on the yes side of the question, a 22% approximate uh, decline in the no side of the question and a slight decrease in I don't know. So this is the final results of our debate again today. And I would like to thank all of the participants uh, that we have had today. We have had Cutler Cleveland, Professor of Earth and Environment, Interim Director of Institute for Global Sustainability at Boston University. On his side of the debate for divestment was Dan Cohn, Global Energy Transition Researcher, Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis. And on the no side of the debate, I'd also like to thank Brad Bradford or Brad Cornell, Professor Emeritus of Financial Economics at the Anderson School of Management at University of California, Los Angeles, and of course, Brent Bennett, Policy Director for Life Powered at Texas Public Policy Foundation. Uh, I think it was an enlightening debate. I thank all of the participants for a nice, lively, and congenial debate. And uh, at this point, I would like to conclude today's energy symposium. So again, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs>